1 John 3 7 now begins the stark contrast between what and what this is the point between the utter sinfulness of who not us the devil and the absolute purity of who not us Jesus Christ the Son of God the sinlessness of the Son of God contrast between these two is a change in context, isn't it? And that's what people miss. If you don't read up to this, these two verses, three, actually, three, seven, three, eight, and three, nine. So little children, born again believers are in view. Let one, no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. That's the level of righteousness we have, absolute perfection. And we've already learned how to get credited with that by constant confession and obedience in the direction of obeying the commandments, studying the scriptures, and moving on with constant confession and being constant informing us of how righteous our Lord is, especially to have paid for the sins of the whole world. He had to be absolutely perfect to the T, absolutely. So the absolute con contrast between God's holiness and the sinless fullness of the devil and his world is stated in the, in the next verse, which compri compares the devil who has sinned from the beginning and who is sin personified and is contrast with who? The one who was born of the seed of God, the Holy Spirit, Matthew one twenty. Have we been born of God? Yes, but not completely and wholly. See, keep this in mind. First John three eight. The one who practices sin is of the devil. And the devil has sinned from the beginning. Do we want to go in that direction? No. We'll back and confess. The Son of God appeared for this purpose. And that purpose is that he might destroy the works of the devil. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, 1 John 3, 9. Each one, or the one who is born of God, referring to the subject of the previous verse. Each one of those two, not us, each one of those two in the previous verse, the Son of God, does not practice sin because his seed, the Holy Spirit, Matthew 120, abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Is that describing you or I? No. The Son of God's purpose is to destroy sin. Therefore, he must be without sin himself. So the Son of God's purpose, therefore, is to destroy sin so that he, may, he must be without sin himself in order to qualify for this task as it states clearly in verse 9. Each one who was born of God, referring to the subject of the previous verse, the Son of God, does not practice sin because his seed, the Holy Spirit, Matthew one twenty, abides in him. Now we have the Holy Spirit abiding in us, but it's not complete to the extent we have to, co we have to uh, cooperate. But we don't have the capacity to cooperate 100% or even at all without imperfection. So he cannot sin, the Son of God, because he is born of God, completely and differently from we are. We're not completely born of God yet. We haven't received our resurrection body. So each one, pa, has no article to the dictionary, T-D-O-T and T, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, says noun, it's without, pa as a noun is without article. Without the article, pa may have distributive significance, each, all, depending upon context. When we look at the previous verse, we only got two there. So each one who was born of God, obviously the devil was not. So we have the Son of God left. Does not sin, cannot be translated, does not practice sin, or refer to the believer at all. Everybody tries to insert that in there. Look at your uh, NIV. Some of those things are just not correct. You can't impose upon Scripture what you would like it to have. So does not practice sin is not there. It's hamotien u Poyai, sin, does, not practice. Robert Wilkins says, the verse is often cited as teaching that genuine believers will not practice sin. They will not sin habitually. 1 John 3, 9 is said to teach. On the other hand, other translations suggest an absolute understanding that the born of God person doesn't sin at all. The habitual sin view cites for evidence the use of the present tense, poi, practices. There are grave problems, Dr. Wilkins says, with this argument. For one thing, the present tense, unaided by qualifying words, does not mean what the habitual sin view suggests. 
In Greek, when the present tense occurs, it can be understood in a number of ways, one of which is the habitual present. However, the habitual present refers to events which occur over and over again repeatedly. If John was saying this about believers sinning, he would about believers sinning, he would be saying that believers do not sin repeatedly. If believers sin daily, as all believers do, 1 John 1, 8 and 10, then they do sin habitually in the grammatical sense. So that just makes the problem worse by trying to alter the text anyway. So, Howard Marshall says, it involves translators in stressing the present continuous form of the verb in a way which they do not do elsewhere in the New Testament. You can't be your own editor. Just observe what the words are saying. Similarly, Dodd writes, it is legitimate to doubt whether... Oops, excuse me. You can finish this. It is legitimate to doubt whether the reader could be expected to grasp grasp so subtle a doctrine simply upon the basis of a precise distinction of tenses within, uh, with, without further guidance. Johannine Epistles. Another difficulty with this understanding is that one wonders why God would preserve believers from being dominated by sin and yet not from sinning altogether. See, it just creates more of a problem than it tries to solve. If believers do not sin habitually because God's seed remains in him, it is hard to understand why God would preserve believers from some sins, but not from all sins. We must therefore wonder whether it is an important point of interpretation can be made to rest on what has been called a grammatical subtlety. We're not all grammatical theologian experts. The average reader wouldn't get this anyway. The habitual sin is also ruled out by the context. In verse 5, John said that there is no sin in Christ. He clearly meant that there is absolutely no sin in him. Then in the very next sentence, he said that those who abide in Christ do not sin. He could hardly have meant that Christ sins not at all, and those who abide in Christ sin, but not a lot. John's point is clearly that sin is never an expression of abiding in Christ. When we abide, we do not sin at all, because we understood the grace of God working in our believer, and we believers who have a sin nature. The opinion was widely popular for a number of decades, that the key to understanding 1 John 3, 9 is to be found in the present tense of the verb to sin. In this view, the verse should be read, whoever has been born of God does not continue to sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot continue to sin because he has been born of God. Compare the similar rendering in the, in the NIV. It's similar. The meaning of this is supposed to be that prolonged continuation in sin does not occur if one is born again. But this raises more questions than answers. Do not all Christians continue to sin until the day of their death? You sin once a week, once a month, once a year. It should continue. Furthermore, do not all Christians sin daily? Isn't daily sin a continuous a continuation in doing it? What could the proposed translation possibly mean? Or how can one, anyone claim not to be continuing in sin? Does a born-again person come to some point at which he ceases to sin? The proposed translation solves nothing. There is no doubt that in an appropriate context, the Greek present tense can have a present progressive force like he is sinning, but the introduction of ideas like continue to or to go on doing require more than the Greek tense to make them intelligible. They need more words, but they're not there. You can't put them in. For this purpose, there, are Greek, there were Greek words as available which are actually used in the New Testament, but not here. For example, diapontos occurs in Luke 24:53 and they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. The same word occurs in Hebrews 13:15. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. And also Mark 5:5, 5, 5, Acts 2, 10:2, 2, 24:16, and so on. The Greek phrase, eis to tientes, could also have the same meaning. The Greek present tense did not by itself convey such ideas. So, as Lou has a very active acutely observed, expository discourse, of which the first letter of John is an example, employs the present predominantly, for it is a zero tense of factual actuality. That is to say, it simply states the action without any kind of elaboration or description. So, it is highly probable that if John had meant something similar to the NIV type of translation of 1 John 3, 9, he would have used the available Greek words to make his point. No first century Greek reader or hearer is likely to get a meaning such as the one that the NIV imports into this text without the necessary additional words. In addition, this appeal to the Greek tense, if used 
every elsewhere in the epistle would lead to havoc. For example, Dodd pointed out, if we translate 1 John 1, 9, if we say that we do not continually have sin, we deceive ourselves. The result is a contradiction to 3, 9, translated the same way. It goes into nonsense. So if someone who is born of God does not continually sin, why should he not say, I do not continually have sin? But if he does say this, he deceives himself according to 1 John 1, 8. Thus the proposed translation of 1 John 3, 9 will not work in 1, 8. If applied there, it produces a contradiction with 3.9, so it can't be. So furthermore, if one could attain sinless perfection or nearly sinless state of, after trusting in Christ as Savior, then there would be no need, be, no need for a, a most of God's word. Only passages would lead up to and include salvation. Therefore, you're, you're good to go. Therefore, a Christian will be perfect. But we have the epistles that constantly point us to a better way in the Christian life by being faithful. That means we could be unfaithful.